When I was a child growing up on a farm in the Midwest, I'd go outside on a clear, dark night, look up in the sky, and I could see thousands of stars. It was easy to imagine we are not alone in the universe. Today, we have ways of reaching out to other worlds that I could never have imagined as a child. For over a half century, astronomers have been pointing radio telescopes to the heavens, seeking signals from advanced civilizations. So far, they haven't found anything. But what happens if the aliens are doing exactly what we're doing, simply listening and not transmitting? It could be a very quiet universe. We are ready, as a civilization and as a species, to take a radically new approach to answering one of the most ancient questions we have had, are we alone? Today, I'll explain why we should begin, in earnest, transmitting powerful, intentional signals to nearby stars in the hope of getting a response, and that even if we never get a reply, the process will be transformative in itself. The idea that the universe is populated is an ancient one. The Greek philosopher Metrodoros, over 2,000 years ago, said, in his words, to consider the world the only populated planet in infinite space is as absurd as to assert that in an entire field sown with millet, only one grain will grow. Now, in the centuries that have followed, philosophical speculation has transformed into scientific experimentation. And by the 1820s, serious people were suggesting ways to communicate with any intelligent beings that might be living on the moon. Uh, the German Mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss suggested going to the forests of Siberia, carving down huge swaths of trees, planting fields of wheat in the shape of geometrical objects to let any Lunarians know that we're savvy about the Pythagorean theorem here on Earth. And, and so that works well uh, if the Lunarians are looking at the side of the Earth that's lit by the sun. <laughs> well, what about the other half of the time? Well, there's a solution. Uh, the uh, astronomer Joseph von Littrow from Austria suggested go to the Sahara Desert, carve a huge canal, tens of miles in diameter in the shape of a circle, fill it with kerosene, light it ablaze, and at night the aliens know that we have an appreciation for the simplicity and elegance of the circle. So those are some of the early proposals from the early 19th century. But as the decades proceeded, astronomers realized that, I'm sorry, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so it's not a very hospitable place for life. So we had to look further away from Earth. And a natural target was the moon. And as telescopes got better, we were able to draw maps of the surface of the moon, and some people drawing these maps saw canals. Some of them suggested that, in fact, these were the creations of intelligent Martians, uh, perhaps huge engineering feats, aqueducts even, that would transport water from one part of the surface to the other. But again, as we progressed in our scientific understanding, we realized that those canals were figments of the human imagination and not structures on the surface of the planet. And so if we wanted to discover intelligence beyond Earth, we would have to go much further. A critical turning point came in 1960 when a young astronomer named Frank Drake used this telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, to look for radio signals from two nearby sun-like stars. Um, he didn't discover any, but he did start a new scientific project called SETI, 
the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that search continues strong to this day. Now, when Drake did his first project, his first search, he didn't know whether any stars have planets around them. But now, with the advances in the intervening decades, we know that when we go out and look at the night sky, virtually all of those stars are orbited by planets. So there's plenty of real estate out there. And the big question is, is anyone home? That's what SETI is trying to solve. Now, over the last 50 plus years, SETI has become increasingly sophisticated. Um, we now have observations from around the world. Today's searches are a trillion times more powerful than that first search. And yet, we still have not discovered ET. And so the big question is why? It's a question that the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi asked, if in fact there's intelligence out there, then why haven't we detected? And it's, it's, be called, it's become called the Fermi paradox in his honor. And today I'd like to suggest one solution to the Fermi paradox and a specific way that we can test it. So maybe in fact there are other civilizations out there, but they're watching us, much like we watch animals in a zoo. So maybe even the nearby stars are populated. Uh, but the question then is, what would we need to do to get the attention and a response from the zookeeper? Well, let's imagine all of us go to the zoo, and we're watching a herd of zebras. And all of a sudden, one of them turns toward us, looks us in the eye, and starts pounding out a series of numbers with its hoof. Now, I, I don't know about all of you, but I'm not going to go head off to the giraffes and see what's going on down there. I'm going to stick around with this zebra and see if I can get an exchange going. So sending an intentional signal pulls for a response, and that's what we can do in a new form of SETI called active SETI. So in the traditional passive SETI, we listen for signals coming in from other stars, and in active SETI, we reverse the process and send powerful, intentional signals to nearby stars in the hope of getting a response. Now, there have been a handful of active SETI transmissions, but the big difference is that they have been one-off events. But to be serious, we need to be committed to transmitting to hundreds, thousands, perhaps even millions of stars to get a response. So it's a much more ambitious project I'm suggesting. The other difference, between what I'm proposing and the Arecibo message from 1974 uh, is the target. That message was sent to a globular cluster of stars called M13, 25,000 light years from Earth. That means it'll take 25,000 years for that radio signal traveling at the speed of light to reach its target and another 25,000 years for a response. I mean, surely we can do better than that, can't we? I mean, let's imagine we target the nearest star system, Proxima Centauri. We could potentially receive a response in a little over eight years. And because we don't know for sure that that system is populated, we need to repeat the process, starting with the stars that are nearest to the Earth and then moving outward. That reduces the possibilities of time delay to the minimum possible. Now, to be clear, if we do make contact with another civilization, one of the things we know is that they're going to be a much older civilization than we are. And here's the reasoning. We have had the technology to communicate across interstellar distances for about a century. That's how long we've had radio. Well, if that's the norm in the galaxy, if other civilizations have radio technology for 100 years, and then they either annihilate themselves in a nuclear war, or they turn inward and become contemplative and stop exploring. If that's the average age of civilizations, then what are the chances that their century and our century will coincide, given the 13 billion year history of the galaxy? Virtually zero. I mean, it's as likely as, over the course of a long, dark night, two fireflies each flick on for a single moment, what's the chance it's going to be the exact same time? Zero. So if we make contact with another civilization, 
they will be much older than we are, a more stable civilization that has made it through their technological bottleneck that we're dealing with right now. We're not very good at dealing with long time scales. And that's the greatest challenge we face with active SETI. We've created a few monuments that have withstood the ages. But as we get ready to launch an ambitious project to communicate with other civilizations, one of the things we have to ask is, should we really invest in something like that when we have no guarantee of success? I think the answer is yes, and here's why. Let's imagine that we have transmitted signals to hundreds, thousands, millions of stars, and then we simply wait and wait for centuries, for millennia, and all we hear is this great cosmic silence. What then? Slowly, it will dawn on us that because we are still listening, because we have committed to a project more ambitious than anything humankind has taken on before, and that we are still working on it thousands of years from now, that we, in fact, have become that stable, long-lived civilization that we've been searching for out there all along. For now, though, we are a civilization in its adolescence. I mean, what better way to describe an adolescent than the words me and now? And that characterizes passive SETI. We're looking for a signal that could benefit us immediately. We could detect a signal tonight. And that's a very appropriate way to start interstellar communication in our youth. But as we look forward to the next half century, I would encourage us to grow up, to think about how we can send messages that will not benefit ourselves, but could potentially benefit others, extraterrestrials and future generations of humans. Sometimes people talk about interstellar communication as an attempt to join the galactic club. What I find so strange is no one ever, ever talks about paying our dues or even submitting an application. Active SETI does both. And it may just the approach that leads to first contact. Thank you.